Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm overclocking the Intel Xeon W7 3465X 28 core Sapphire Rapids CPU all the way up to 5.1 gigahertz. For that, I'll be using the Asus WSW790E Sage SE motherboard and EK Pro custom loop water cooling. I'll primarily do the overclocking by adjusting the turbo boost ratios using a little bit of per core ratio limit tuning and of course adaptive voltage mode. All right, we have a lot to cover, so let's jump straight in. The Intel Xeon W7-3465X is part of Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processor lineup, better known as Sapphire Rapids. Sapphire Rapids is the successor to, well, a variety of architectures. On the four socket, eight socket server side, it's the successor to the 2020 14 nanometer Cooper Lake. On the one socket, two socket server and workstation side, it's the successor to the 2021 10 nanometer Ice Lake. And on the high end desktop or HEDT side, it's the successor to the 2019 14 nanometer Cascade Lake. Enthusiasts like myself can think of the Sapphire Rapids W790 platform as the successor of the overclockable Cascade Lake X processors. But perhaps the real spiritual predecessor is the overclockable 28 core Xeon W3175X launched in 2018. Intel spoke at length about Sapphire Rapids during the 2021 Architecture Day. I won't go over the architecture details, but suffice to say there are some significant improvements over Ice Lake, Cooper Lake and Cascade Lake. The most significant improvements are the Intel 7 process technology and up to 56 Golden Cove P cores. It also features PCIe 5.0, DDR5 ECC RDIMM support and Intel's third generation deep learning boost technology. Lastly, Sapphire Rapids transitions from a single monolithic die design to a multi-tile design for increased scalability. Well, sort of. Only the Xeon W3400 series uses the multi-tile die design, whereas the Xeon W2400 segment still features a monolithic die. And that's not where the difference between the W2400 and W3400 segment ends. While the W3400 series go up to 56 P cores, the W2400 only goes up to 24 P cores. The W3400 series supports 8 channel memory, whereas the W2400 series only supports 4 channel memory. The W3400 series also supports 112 PCIe 5.0 lanes, whereas the W2400 series only supports 64 lanes. Intel further segments the Sapphire Rapid CPUs according to the Xeon W3, W5, W7 and W9 brands. That's similar to how we have Core i3 to Core i9 on the mainstream desktop. Xeon W9 is reserved exclusively for the W3400 series and you can only find Xeon W3 processors in the Xeon W2400 product line. Xeon W5 and W7 are available in both series. Across all Sapphire Rapids workstation products, eight overclockable SKUs are split evenly between the W2400 and W3400 segments. The Xeon W7-3465X has 28 P cores with 56 threads. The base frequency is 2.5 GHz, the Turbo Boost 2.0 boost frequency is 4.6 GHz, and the Turbo Boost Max 3.0 boost frequency is 4.8 GHz. The maximum boost frequency gradually decreases from 4.8 GHz for up to two active cores to 3.2 GHz when all cores are active. The base TDP is 300 Watt and the Turbo TDP is 360 Watt. The TJ Max is 97 degrees Celsius. In this video we will be covering four overclocking strategies. First we rely on ASUS MCE and ASUS memory presets. Second, we use the ASUS Watercooled OC preset. Third, we try a simple basic overclock. And lastly, we go for a simple but dynamic overclock. But before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. 
The Easy Fan Controller Scatterbencher Edition is a custom version of Elmo Labs EFC and it's a collaboration between Scatterbencher and Elmo Labs. I explain how I use the EFC SB in a separate video on this channel. By connecting the EFC SB to the EVC2 device, I can monitor the ambient temperature, water temperature and fan duty cycle. I include those measurements in my Prime95 stability test results. I also use the Elmo Labs EVC SB to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a good indication of whether the cooling solution is saturated. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, of course we have to check the performance at default settings. Do note that on this motherboard, the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits are unlocked by default. So if we want to find out what's the stock performance of this chip, we first have to go into the BIOS and go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Disabled Enforce All Limits. Then save and exit the BIOS. The default Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters for the Xeon W73465X are as follows. Here is the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3 Mark CPU profile scores at stock. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2553 MHz with 0.828 volts. The average CPU temperature is 39 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.1 and 32 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 299 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3093 MHz with 0.884 volts. The average CPU temperature is 41 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.2 and 31.9 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 299.8 watts. Now let's get to our first overclocking strategy, but before that, make sure to locate the clear CMOS button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. However, it does not delete any of the BIOS profiles previously saved. The clear CMOS button is located on the rear IO panel. In our first overclocking strategy, we use ASUS Multicore Enhancement to unleash the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits and we also overclock the memory. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 allows the processor to run faster than the base frequency when the conditions are right. The conditions are specified by the CPU's temperature, current use and power consumption. The ultimate advantage of Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 is of course more performance in single-threaded and multi-threaded applications. The Turbo Boost algorithm works according to a proprietary EWMA formula. That stands for Exponentially Weighed Moving Average. There are three parameters to consider, PL1, PL2 and Tau. Obviously, the Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 technology is available on Sapphire Rapids as it's the primary driver over base performance. An easy ASUS multi-core enhancement option on ASUS motherboards allows you to unleash the turbo boost power limits. Set the option to enabled remove all limits and enjoy maximum performance. Adjusting the turbo boost 2.0 power limits is strictly speaking not considered overclocking and that's because we don't change any of the processors frequency, temperature or electrical parameters. Intel provides the Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters as a guidance to system integrators and motherboard vendors to ensure that their products can support the base performance of our CPU. But of course, better tuned systems, for example, with better thermal solutions or better motherboards with maybe higher quality VRMs can sustain peak performance for longer. ASUS Memory Presets is an ASUS performance enhancing technology that provides the users with a selection of pre-tuned memory presets for certain ICs. The presets will adjust the timings as well as the voltage. The technology was first introduced in 2012 on Z77 and has been on select ASUS ROG motherboards ever since. Four memory profiles are available on the ASUS Pro WS-W790E Sage SE motherboard. 
two each for Hynix and Micron. Since our memory can overclock pretty well, we use the profile for Hynix DDR5-6800 memory. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enable to Remove All Limits. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6800. Enter the DRAM Timing Control submenu. Enter the Memory Presets submenu. Select Load Hynix 6800 1.4V 8x16GB Single Rank. Select Yes. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. The performance improves slightly after unleashing the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits and increasing the memory frequency. In light workloads, the performance gain is minimal. However, as the workload intensity increases, the performance gains also increase. We see the most significant improvement of plus 13.49% in the heavy and memory sensitive Y Cruncher workload. When running Prime 95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3095 MHz with 0.881 volts. The average CPU temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 28.7 and 35.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 467 watts. When running Prime 95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3128 MHz with 0.886 volts. The average CPU temperature is 46 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.8 and 33.8 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 404.2 watts. In our second overclocking strategy, we rely on the ASUS water-cooled OC preset to get more performance out of this system. However, the use of the preset isn't as straightforward as it was with the 2495X or with the 3435X that we already overclocked on this channel. The issue with the preset on this system is that it's not entirely stable. And I'll explain in due time why that is. But before I can explain why it's unstable, I want to introduce you to three overclocking technologies, Intel Turbo Boost 2.0, Intel Turbo Boost Max 3.0, and Intel's Adaptive Voltage Mode. We all know the Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 from its impact on the power limits, but a second very important aspect of Turbo Boost 2.0 tuning is the fact that you can set the CPU to run at a certain frequency based on the number of active cores. Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio configuration allows us to configure the overclock for different scenarios ranging from one active core to all active cores. Intel provides eight registers to configure the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratios. On mainstream platforms where the top SKU has no more than eight P cores, these registers are configured from one active P core to eight active P cores. However, on platforms with core counts beyond eight cores, we can configure each register by target turbo boost ratio and number of active cores. Note that by core usage doesn't mean that we're overclocking the cores individually. By core usage means that we determine an overclock based on the number of active cores. But at the end of the day, the CPU will still determine which of those cores are running at that frequency. In 2016, Intel introduced a technology called Intel Turbo Boost Max 3.0. Even though it carries the same name like Intel Turbo Boost 2.0, it's not really a successor to Turbo Boost 2.0. Intel Turbo Boost Max 3.0 aims to exploit the natural variance that is found in multi-core CPUs. That natural variance is that some cores are better than others and it identifies those better cores and calls those the favored cores. Those favored cores have two main advantages. First, Intel allows for additional frequency boosts of the favored cores. On the Sapphire Rapids Xeon W7 3465X, there are four favored P cores. Two can boost to 4.8 GHz and two can boost to 4.7 GHz. The rest of the non-favored cores are limited to 4.6 GHz. Second, the operating system will automatically assign the most demanding workloads to these favored cores, ensuring potentially higher performance. 
The water-cooled OC preset is an excellent addition to the Asus Pro WS W790 motherboards, giving Xeon customers an easy path to additional performance. By enabling the preset, the frequency in all situations, except for when two cores are active, increases. The all-core frequency even goes up by 800MHz from 3.2GHz to 4GHz. In addition, it also adjusts the per-core ratio limits for a variety of cores. The water-cooled OC profile has 4 cores going up to 4.8GHz, 12 cores going up to 4.6GHz, 4 cores up to 4.5GHz, and 4 cores up to 4.4GHz, and finally, 4 cores going up to 4.0 GHz. While it seemingly does all this without adjusting the voltage, actually it does. We can see that when we have a closer look. 24 cores get assigned a core-specific adaptive voltage ranging from 1.1 volt for 44x to 1.2 volt for 48x. The 4 cores with a ratio limit of 40x get an override voltage of 0.9 volt. This override voltage is likely chosen to help get lower temperatures in all core heavy workloads. We'll discuss the voltage on Sapphire Rapids later in the video. As I said in the beginning of this video, this profile isn't entirely stable. As you'll see in a minute, it is stable when we talk about light or medium workloads, but when we throw heavy all core workloads at it, the system becomes unstable. And the reason is quite simple. The voltage adjustments of the preset are just a tad too aggressive for this particular CPU and is causing the instabilities. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ACES multi-core enhancement to enabled remove all limits. Set CPU core ratio to water-cooled OC preset. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5-6800. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory preset submenu. Select Load Hynix 6800 1.4V 8x16GB single rank, select Yes, then save and exit the BIOS. We re-ran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. When enabling the water-cooled OC preset, this system becomes unstable in most heavy workloads. On the flip side, the performance improvement is significant when the system is stable enough to pass the benchmarks. We get a maximum performance improvement of plus 33% in 3DMark CPU profile for threads. Unfortunately, the system is unstable when running Prime95. In our third overclocking strategy, we pursue a simple, basic manual overclock. Since the ACES water-cooled preset didn't work out for us, we're going to aim to do a simple overclock without touching the voltages, but by using the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio configuration. So this will be a pretty short OC strategy. As I explained in the previous overclocking strategy, Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 technology allows us to configure the CPU frequency based on the number of active cores. From the Xeon W7-3465X specification, we know that every core is specified to run up to 46X that four favored cores are specced up to 47x, and that two super favored cores can even go all the way up to 48x. However, we also know that the CPU is restricted to much lower frequencies as more cores become active. So we can use this information to extract a lot more performance in multi-threaded applications. In this overclocking strategy, we simply lift the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio from when 5 cores are active to 46x. That should give us a boost of 300MHz when 5 cores are active, up to a boost of 1.4GHz when all 28 cores are active. As I pointed out in the previous OC strategy, since every core has a VF curve up to at least their maximum default frequency, we don't have to adjust any voltage. The CPU can use the default VF curve to regulate each core's voltage. However, we do make one change to the voltages. We slightly increase the VCC in voltage to 2.4 volt. That makes it easier on the VCC IN VRM. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS multi-core enhancement to enabled remove all limits. Set CPU core ratio to by core usage. Enter the by core usage submenu. 
Set turbo ratio limit 1 to 48. Set turbo ratio cores 1 to 2. Set turbo ratio limit 2 to 47. Set turbo ratio cores 2 to 4. Set turbo ratio limit 3 to 46. Set turbo ratio cores 3 to 28. Leave the by core usage submenu. Enter the specific core submenu. Set double starred core specific ratio limit to 48. Set single starred core specific ratio limit to 47. Set star less core specific ratio limit to 46. Leave the specific core submenu. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5 6800. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6800 1.4 volt 8 by 16 gigabyte single rank. Select yes. Leave the memory presets submenu. Leave the DRM timing control submenu. Set vCore 1.8 volt in to manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 2.4, then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. We significantly improved the system performance after these minor adjustments in the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio configuration. The heavy all core workloads improve in particular. We see a maximum performance increase of plus 50.76% in Y Cruncher. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4432 MHz with 1.148 volts. The average CPU temperature is 96 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 33 and 46.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 797.4 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4587 MHz with 1.18 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 31.8 and 42.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 681.8 watts. In our fourth and final overclocking strategy, we will pursue a simple dynamic overclock, which is a little bit more complex than OC strategy number three. In order to get started, I need to talk to you about a couple of things regarding Sapphire Rapids. First, we'll talk about the Sapphire Rapids overclocking toolkit, and then we'll also talk a little bit about Sapphire Rapids clocking topology and the voltage topology. The clocking of the standard Sapphire Rapids platform slightly differs from what we're used to with mainstream platforms. The standard clocking topology relies on a 25 megahertz crystal or crystal oscillator input. The platform supports multiple clocking topologies, balanced and unbalanced. The specific implementation depends on your choice of motherboard. You'll likely see all motherboards adopting a balanced clocking architecture. That means if you increase the CPU BCLK, you also increase the CPU PCIe clock frequency. Either way, the external clock generator generates multiple 100 or 25 MHz clock sources. These sources can be used in a variety of ways. The 100 MHz CPU BCLK is then multiplied with specific ratios for each of the different parts inside the CPU. Each P-Core can run at its independent frequency. The mesh PLL ties together the last level cache, cache block, and seemingly also the memory controller. It can run an independent frequency from the P-Cores. On the multi-tile dies of the W3400 processors, the mesh ratio is limited to 2.7 GHz, or 27X. The memory frequency is also driven by the CPU BCLK and multiplied by a memory ratio. Unlike on mainstream desktop, the memory frequency is not tied to the memory controller frequency and can run independently. Sapphire Rapids uses a combination of fully integrated voltage regulators, fiber, and motherboard voltage regulators, MBVR, for power management. There are eight distinct voltage inputs to a Sapphire Rapids processor. Most of these power inputs power a fiber or fully integrated voltage regulator. The fiber then manages the voltage provided to the specific parts of the CPU. The end user can then control some of these voltages. The voltages most relevant for Sapphire Rapids W3400 processor overclocking are those driven by the VCC in, including the P-Core and mesh voltages, and to a lesser extent, the voltages driven by the VCC FA EHV, including the VCC CFN and VCC MDFI. 
I described the history of Intel's overclocking toolkit in a different video on this channel titled How is Alder Lake non-K overclocking even possible? The long story short is that Intel has developed and maintained a technology called the OC Mailbox, which contains all of Intel's overclocking tools. Now, the tools that are available for one architecture may be different than those that are available for another architecture. So for example, on Sapphire Rapids, these are the tools that are included in the overclocking toolkit. Notably missing from the OC toolbox are prominent features we know from mainstream desktop, like advanced voltage offset, better known as the VF points, and overclocking thermal velocity boost, or OCTVB. Just like any other previous Intel architecture, there are two ways to configure the voltage for the CPU cores, override mode and adaptive mode. Override mode specifies a single static voltage across all ratios. It is mainly used for extreme overclocking, where stability at high frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation. In adaptive mode, the CPU relies on the factory-fused voltage frequency curves to set the appropriate voltage for a given ratio. Since Sapphire Rapids uses Fiverr, we can only adjust the core voltage by configuring the CPU PCU via BIOS or specialized tools like XTU. We can specify a voltage offset for override and adaptive mode. Of course, this doesn't make much sense for override mode, but it can be helpful in adaptive mode as you can offset the entire VF curve by up to 500 millivolt in either direction. On Sapphire Rapids, you can control the CPU core voltage on a global or per core level. Let's have a look at adaptive voltage mode and see how it works for a single core. When we set an adaptive voltage for a core, this voltage is mapped against the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU across all settings and cores. The default maximum turbo ratio determines the OC ratio when you leave everything at default. The OC ratio equals the highest configured ratio if you overclock. Specific rules govern what adaptive voltage can be set. The voltage set for a given ratio n must be higher than or equal to the voltage set for ratio n minus 1. Suppose our 3465X runs 48X at 1.3 volt. In that case, setting the adaptive voltage mapped to 48X lower than 1.3 volt is pointless. 48X always runs at 1.3 volt or higher. Usually, biases may allow you to configure lower values. However, the CPU's internal mechanisms will override your configuration if it doesn't follow the rules. The adaptive of voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio will be ignored. Take the same example of the 3465X specified to run 48X at 1.3 volt. If you try to configure all cores to 45X and set 1.1 volt, the CPU will ignore this because it has its own factory fused target voltage for all ratios up to 48X and will use this voltage. For ratios between the OC ratio and the next highest factory fused VF point, the voltage is interpolated between the set adaptive voltage and the factory fused voltage. Returning to our example of a 3465X specified to run 48X at 1.3 volt, let's say we manually configure the OC ratio to be 52X at 1.4 volt. The target voltage for ratios 51X, 50X and 49X will now be interpolated between 1.3 volt and 1.4 volt. As I mentioned, we can do all this for every of the 28 cores inside our CPU. But obviously, that would take a lot of time. That would be a lot of work. So fortunately, there's another way to configure the adaptive voltage on a global level. When we set a global adaptive voltage, it maps this voltage to the OC ratio for each core in our CPU. So if our OC ratio is 52X and the global adaptive voltage is 1.4 volt, then every core in our CPU has a voltage frequency curve that goes up to 52X at 1.4 volt. That certainly makes things easier. The per core ratio limit and voltage allows us to control the upper end of every core's VF curve. While the general rules for adaptive voltage mode still apply, 
This opens up a couple of new avenues for CPU overclocking and fine tuning. First, it allows users to overclock each core and find its maximum stable frequency individually. Second, it allows users to set an aggressive by core usage overclock while constraining the worst cores. Since each core has an independent Fiverr regulated power rail, it is possible to fine tune each core to its maximum capability. When we set a per core ratio limit, counterintuitively, this ratio doesn't act as a core specific OC ratio, but as a means to limit what parts of the VF curve can be used. Let's use that same example of the 52X at 1.4 volt. If we set the per core ratio limit to 51X, the CPU core will boost up to 5.1 gigahertz at a voltage that's interpolated between 52X at 1.4 volt and 48X at 1.3 volt. Similarly, if we set a per core adaptive voltage, this voltage is mapped to the OC ratio. The voltage interpolation is based on the core specific voltage frequency curve. So each core has the same OC ratio mapped to a core specific adaptive voltage I will dig deeper into this topic when we get to the manual tuning process. But first, let's have a look at this CPU's voltage frequency curve. Each core inside this Xeon W7-3465X has its own factory-fused voltage frequency curve. According to the specification, two cores can run up to 4.8 GHz, two cores can run up to 4.7 GHz, and the rest of the 28 cores can only run up to 4.6 GHz. We'd expect each of the 28 cores to have a factory fused specific voltage for its maximum ratio. We can investigate this theory by mapping the voltage frequency curve of every core inside this CPU. The process is pretty simple. Set the C state to C0, C1 in the BIOS to ensure the CPU cores always run at the maximum frequency. We use Shimino's OC tool or Intel Extreme Tuning Utility to set all cores to a fixed frequency. Double check that each core's per core ratio limit is also set to this frequency. Then we use hardware info to check the maximum VID for each core. When we checked the voltage frequency curves for this Xeon W73465X, we didn't exactly find what we expected. We can put the 28 cores in four buckets. RFCs or rightfully favored cores, UNFCs or unrightfully non-favored cores, NRCs or normal regular cores, and SRCs or shitty regular cores. RFCs are favored cores and have a VF curve up to 4.8x. It includes cores 0, 1, 3, and 20. UNFCs are not favored but have a VF curve up to 48x. That includes cores 5, 17, and 19. NRCs are regular cores with a VF curve up to only 4.6 GHz and a reasonable maximum voltage. That includes cores 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 21, 22, 23, 25, 26, and 27. SRCs are also regular cores with a VF curve up to only 4.6 GHz, but the highest voltage is exceptionally high. That includes cores 7, 9, and 24. So not only do we have cores inside the CPU that are not favored, but have VF cores as if they would be a favored core, we also have these three regular cores with really exceptionally high VID for the highest VF point. This information will be very useful when we start our manual tuning process. Intel first introduced the AVX ratio offsets on Broadwell E in 2016 and then it later expanded that with an AVX2 offset and an AVX512 ratio offset. New on Sapphire Rapids is the addition of TMOL ratio offset. TMOL stands for Tile Matrix Multiply and is an Intel Advanced Matrix Extension AMX technology component. It is designed to accelerate AI and deep learning workloads. The rabbit hole of AVX offsets go deep, but it suffice to know three pieces of information for this guide. 1. By default, the AVX ratio offset is 0. 2. The AVX ratio offset is applied on a per core basis as it's subtracted from each core's per core ratio limit. And 3. The ratios are triggered based on workload intensity, not necessarily what type of instructions. 
that last part is crucial because light AVX workloads may not trigger the offset and heavy non-AVX workloads may. As I demonstrated in my two previous Sapphire Rapids overclocking guides, making a dynamic overclock with Sapphire Rapids CPUs is pretty tricky. And there's two main reasons for that. First, as I highlighted, the CPU core VF curves are strange. Not only do some cores have curves beyond their maximum allowed default frequency, but some also have maximum voltages that are exceptionally high. For example, non-favored core 17 has a VF curve up to 48x at 1.31 volt. Second, this CPU has 28 cores that can be tuned individually. Finding the most optimal overclock for each CPU core will be a painstaking activity unless we find tuning shortcuts. Since I've received many requests to provide more detail on my manual tuning process, let's dig into the practical side of Sapphire Rapids tuning. The first step is obviously setting our overclocking objective. Since we already figured out how to get more multi-core performance in the previous overclocking strategy, in this overclocking strategy, I'll be focused on getting more performance in single-threaded applications. So I need higher frequencies. Ultimately, the highest possible frequency will be determined by the maximum voltage that we will set in the BIOS. I know that the maximum factory fused voltage is 1.31 volt for core 17, so I pick a maximum voltage for all the cores of 1.35 volt. When I set an adaptive core voltage of 1.35 volt, it means every core will have the voltage of its highest VF point set at 1.35 volt. What that VF point's frequency is, well, that's something we need to figure out. I tried to shorten the test procedure by relying on Core Cycler. Spoon initially developed this nifty stability test script to test Curve Optimizer for AMD CPUs, but I often use it on other platforms too. In short, the script cycles through each CPU core, applying a workload of your choice like Prime95, Y-Cruncher, or Ada, and it tells you which core is unstable. First, I ensure each core runs stable through 30 seconds of Core Cycler Prime95 SSE. Then I verify the stability for 30 seconds of Core Cycler Prime95 AVX2. Lastly, I also run 30 seconds of Y-Cruncher 0086X. If my configuration passes all these tests, I try higher frequencies. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Yes and no. You have to be aware that increasing the ratio by one step may also decrease the voltage for a given VF point. Let me explain that by having a look back at our voltage frequency curves. As we know, each core has its own factory fused voltage frequency curve. At default, each VF curve has a maximum voltage equal to the highest VF point. For some cores, that's at 46x, and for others, it's at 48x. Let's say we set all cores to 50x with an adaptive voltage of 1.35 volt. This is what the VF curve looks like for each core. While at 45x, the voltage ranges from 1.136 volt for core 20 to 1.251 volt for core 7, all VF curves converge to 50x at 1.35 volt. Now let's see what happens when we increase the frequency to 52x, but keep the same voltage of 1.35 volt. This is what the VF curve looks like for each core. As expected, the VF curves now converge to 52x at 1.35 volt. But did you also notice that the voltage for most VF points is lower than before? We can better illustrate this by mapping the average VF point across all of our cores. Let's compare three data points the factory fused VF curve, a manual curve to 50x at 1.35 volt, and a manual curve at 52x at 1.35 volt. The factory fused average VF point at 49x is 1.214 volt. As we increase the OC ratio, while we keep the same adaptive voltage, the voltage for ratios between our factory fused highest VF point and the OC ratio will reduce. If we'd set 55x at 1.35 volt, the average voltage at 49x would be 1.257 volt. Much lower than what the voltage is at if we have the VF point at 52x with 1.35 volt, 
or at 50x at 1.35 volt. As I said, this is a crucial aspect of per core manual tuning on Sapphire Rapids. The implication is that if a core is stable with 50x at 1.35 volt, the core may become unstable when we set 52x at 1.35 volt, even if we set the per core ratio limit to 50x. That's why I run core cycler across all cores every time I increase the frequency. For configuring the overclock, you can rely on any tool. For this guide, I choose Intel Extreme Tuning Utility. First, I set the 50x and 1.35 volt in the BIOS. Then I run the core cycler tests. If a core fails, I reduce that core's ratio limit by one and try again. Here's my complete tuning test lock. As you can see, it's not a quick process as many cores can fail for any given reason. During my testing, many cores could reach 5.4 gigahertz, but ultimately ran into strange stability issues whenever I set the bi-core usage ratio over 51x from BIOS. After spending way more time than I should trying to figure out what was going on, I settled for a modest manual overclock of 5.1 gigahertz for all cores except for core seven and an AVX offset of minus three. Lastly, I added the PMD USB to my setup to measure the input CPU power to the motherboard. That's because while the reported CPU package power and hardware info for this CPU during a Prime95 AVX2 stability test run is about 800 watt, my wall socket power measurement showed 1500 watt. That's a large discrepancy, so I wanted to see how much power the CPU pulls during the stability testing. As you'll see in a minute, the power draw is over 1100 watts. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to Bicore Usage. Enter the Bicore Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 51. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 1 to 8. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 2 to 49. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 2 to 12. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 3 to 48. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 3 to 16. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 4 to 47. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 4 to 28. Leave the By Core Usage submenu. Enter the specific core submenu. Set Core 7 Specific Ratio Limit to 50. Leave the specific core submenu. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6800. Enter the AVX Related Controls submenu. Set AVX2 Ratio Offset to Per Core Ratio Limit to User Specify. Set AVX2 ratio offset to 3. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6800 1.4 volt 8 by 16 gigabyte single rack. Select yes. Leave the memory presets submenu. Leave the DRAM timing control submenu. Set max CPU cache ratio to 27. Set vCore 1.8 volt into manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 2.4 volt. Set global core ISVID voltage to adaptive mode. Set additional turbo mode CPU core voltage to 1.35 volt. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. We get a solid uplift in single and lightly threaded benchmarks by increasing the maximum core frequency of most cores by 500 megahertz from 4.6 gigahertz to 5.1 gigahertz. For example, we get a plus 23.14% performance uplift in 3MARC CPU profile 1 thread. Overall, we get the highest performance improvement of plus 50.60% in V-Ray 5. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4,368 MHz with 1.134 volts. The average CPU temperature is 96 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 33 and 45.2 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 760.5 watts, and the average CPU input power is 1,140.7 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4,466 MHz with 1.154 volts. The average CPU temperature is 91 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 32.9 and 42.3 degrees Celsius. 
the average CPU package power is 639.4 watts, and the average CPU input power is 930.3 watts. All right, let's wrap this up. To be honest, it took me way too much time to finish this guide. I set up this system all the way back in May and only finished the guide in August. And I guess the video will be up in September. So that's what, three, four months? The reason why it took me so long is that Sapphire Rapids is actually a pretty tricky platform to fine tune, both for single threaded and multi threaded applications. The real challenge with multi threaded applications is power consumption. As I've shown in my guide, if you go from idle to a heavy Prime 95 workload, the power will spike over 1000 watts. So you really need to set up your motherboard and your VRM configuration accordingly. So to make sure that it can handle that power spike. For single threaded applications, the issue is that it's very difficult to distinguish which core is creating the instability, even with specialized tools like Core Cycler. At the end of the day, we only have one VF point that we can use to tune the VF curves of all of our cores. So that just makes it difficult to finesse our Sapphire Rapids CPU. But the performance improvement is worth it. Getting over 50% additional performance after overclocking is actually pretty exciting. And that's, that's pretty awesome. Anyway, that's it for me for this video. I want to thank you for watching and the Patreons for their support. As per usual, I'll have a written version of this guide up on my blog. And if you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section below. And see you next time.